Yeah, and we're going to start it tonight, of course, as you can see the screens, and uh, it will run us through the end uh, of January, and uh, I am super excited about it. For the past three or four months, I've actually been, uh, in my own personal time, been reading some like Jonah commentary from a guy that I normally wouldn't read, um, and it's been like enlightening to me almost. Like I am seeing this book in just a new light that I've never really seen it as, because I think a lot of us has heard the story of Jonah. Even for those of us who didn't grow up in church, you might have heard this outside of biblical teaching, even this story of a guy who gets swallowed by a fish and spit up on dry land. You might have even heard it as told like a mythical story or an Aesop's fable type thing. How many of you guys have ever heard the story of Jonah? This dude gets swallowed by a fish, gets spit up by a fish, and goes to this city and they repent. So that's the story that we're looking at. I feel like you guys probably know a little bit about it, but I'm hoping that I can really open your eyes to some things about the story of Jonah and about the book of Jonah that really have far less to do with Jonah and more to do with you. Because I think that when we look at the life of Jonah, it might feel like, man, this happened thousands of years ago. It doesn't have anything to do with me. You might think of Jesus in the same way. But I think that there are so many things about Jonah's life that are right here with us, that we are experiencing, that we are dealing with, that we act in the same way that Jonah did. And I'm hoping that I can get some of those truths uh, across from you. I have read nothing on my notes, so hopefully that doesn't set par for the rest of the night because it's going to be a long night. Uh, all right, so that is what we're looking at. And the title of this series is called God's Provision. In our reluctance. Let's say that together. God's provision in our reluctancy. Now, I know those are words that we don't typically use a lot, like provision and reluctancy, but we do understand the concept. But I want to talk about them for briefly because if we don't get these two things, I feel like this series might not make a whole lot of sense. So let's talk about the first one. Let's talk about provision. So when we think about provision, uh, it's like God is providing. Or even if you think of a provision in your own life, it is the idea of providing something. But when we look at it in this book, through this lens, we're looking at God providing something out of his own kind of duty, out of his own merit. Like he decides it and he provides it. And this happens to us all the time. Would anybody just like go out and say, like, yeah, God provides stuff for me all the time. All right, two of you, great, perfect. All right, God does provide stuff for us all the time. And I think a lot of times we don't see it. We don't know that it's God providing for us. Like God is like, I really, want, I really know that Alan needs this person in their life, and so I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to connect them. And God does it. We have no idea that it was God. We just think that it was like something that happened, but God was really sovereign of that situation. He intentionally made that happen because he knows that that's what's important and that's what was needed in our life uh, at that time. Like he blesses us with a gift or a talent and we just think it's genetics, but it's actually God designed us that way. God wants us to be gifted and talented in that way. So maybe you have a gift or a talent. I think that's something God has provided for you. Maybe God puts you into a place of leadership, like on your sports team or on a club at school or on some other team. And you think it's just because I'm really good. And I really think that at times it's God providing you with a place to be in leadership, to have impact on other people's life. I think God provides for us in so many ways that we don't necessarily see that or know that that's what's happening. There are also other things that God provides for us that are not necessarily like uh, case by case. Like we all woke up and the sun was shining, right? It's actually Ohio and the sun doesn't always shine here, but the Browns won a game today, right? The sun's shining. Yeah, I actually don't like football. Um, so yeah, like the sun shining. Or maybe we woke up and there's air to breathe. We're all breathing right now. Maybe you're a little stuffy because you got a mask on and it's hard to breathe. Um, but we're all breathing. Like Those are things God provides for us because I believe that God created nature. And naturally, those things flow from it. The sun is part of God's creation. He provides for us. But when we're looking at the book of Jonah, I think a all of these things that God has provided for Jonah, I think what God provides for us, are intentional, are case by case. Like God provided something for Jonah. And at times, when like God is up to something really good, when God is doing something in our world or in our community or in our friends' lives, we're like, I don't want anything to do with that. We're like reluctant to like jump on the train and like go with it. We're just kind of like, 
that's cool, but like that's not for me. I don't really want to have anything to do with that. Six years ago, I was sporting an Android, all right? You can boo me. That's fine, yeah. Or maybe you're, wow. And I thought that Android was the best, all right? This was actually a picture of my phone. I found it. An HTC Sense. Now, it was six years ago, which was 20, oh, 20, I can't do math, 2015. But it was actually 2014 because I wrote this talk a couple weeks ago. And uh, so it was two years ago, and I was rocking an Android. But like all of my friends and all of my family even all the kids that were in my youth group at the time, they were like, you, you're stupid. I mean, basically, they were like, you should have an iPhone because iPhones are way better. But I was like, no, like I love my Android. The screen was bigger at the time. It had a SD card that you could slot, flop in the side of it. So you had like as much memory as you ever wanted. I had an Android tablet. I was like, why would I ever go to an iPhone that's dumb? I love my Android. And then in September 2014, the, uh, Apple released the iPhone 6 Plus, all right? And I was like, finally, a screen that like fits in my hand. Like, this is cool. And so I swapped over and I got an iPhone 6 Plus, all right? And now I am thoroughly brainwashed, uh, full of Apple products. I actually looked at getting an Apple Pen this week. They're too expensive. I'm not getting one. But I mean, like everything I have now uh, is Apple. And it's hard for me to imagine ever going back to an Android device or PC or whatever, but the reality is I was very, very reluctant in the beginning to swap over. I was like, I'm not doing that. Like that I, that's cool for you guys, but like Android's way better. Like you guys are just getting widgets on your phone, you know? Android's had that for like 10 years. It's like not a new thing. And I was like, this is so cool. It's customizable. I'm not a sheep. And then I bought an iPhone. And now I've always ever had iPhones. So that is what I talk about with reluctancy. Like we kind of got a feeling that we should we kind of know a direction that we should go, but we're like, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to hold off. And I think the reality is that when we are reluctant, we get the bad end of the deal. When we don't jump on what God has for us and his plan and his will, we're going to miss out. And now I feel very happy with an iPhone uh, because I guess, I don't know if you're connecting that with me following God's will or not, but it could maybe be said uh, like that. So that's what we're looking at. God's provision in our reluctancy, our hesitation to embrace what God has for us. I want us to look at this passage uh, today. It comes from Jonah chapter 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to where? Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And so God tells Jonah, Go to this city of Nineveh to tell them how evil that they are being. And in this Old Testament story, we see a unique picture of what God is telling his prophet to do. Because when we think about the Old Testament, we think of God and Israel. And Nineveh is not an Israelite city. It's actually the capital city of one of like Israel's enemies. And they were like everything anti-Israel, you might would say. Like they were very barbaric. They were kind of um, uh, brutal. Uh, in fact, they were actually so domineering, they were so uh, like aggressive that the surrounding nations, including Israel, would often pay them money so that they wouldn't attack them. It was like, please don't beat me up, bully, you know, and they gave them money so they wouldn't attack them. And so Jonah is having this battle here of why would I go to my enemy, to these people that are probably just going to kill me anyways, why would I go to them and tell them about the one true God. And so he has this battle of he doesn't want to go there. So let's look at what Jonah does. It says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Notice he's trying to leave not a place or a person. He's trying to leave God's presence. He's trying to get away from the presence of God. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish away from the presence of of the Lord. In fact, that phrase presence of the Lord is only used a few times in the Old Testament. So it's really significant that Jonah is, is looking at this. We believe that Jonah wrote this uh, after the fact, and he's trying to flee God's presence. It's not, not going to happen, but that's what he is trying to do. Now, I want to point out that Joppa is a long way from Tarshish. In fact, there's a map uh, for those of you who like maps. I think there's a map, yeah. Like, that's a long way. So Joppa and Tarshish are like 2,500 miles away, and Nineveh is only 550 miles away. So, so he is like, 
I'm out of here. Like I'm going and literally as far, that's like the farthest place that I know where to go. So I'm just going to like go there because I do not want to go to Nineveh, uh, the capital of the Assyrian nation at the time. And I think it just goes to show that like God's plan for Jonah, God really wanted him to go to Nineveh. That's what he commanded him to do. And Jonah's like, I'm going to try to go to this way other place. When I was in high school, my, uh, one of my teachers used to say it like this, is that uh, he used it in reference to sin. He said, it will take you farther than you want to go, it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And for Jonah, he is definitely going to find out that that is true, but I think the same is true uh, for us. That when we think about like God's commands for us and what God has taught us and showed us in the Bible, we look at God's commands about honesty, uh, about sexuality, about evangelism, and we're like, God, that's hard. That's unbearable. Like, how could you ever ask me to actually do that? You actually want me to do that? That is difficult. How could you expect me to obey these sexual rules? Or how could you expect me to evangelize to people that I don't even know? God, that is hard. When we look at that, but I think the thing that's really hard is when we go against that. Like if we go against God's idea of honesty, and like you're known as the person nobody can trust. Or if you go against God's idea for sexuality, you say, you know what, I'm going to sleep with whoever I want to and whenever I want to and however I want to. And then you get to marriage and you're bringing with you all this sexual baggage. Or your friends who you know you need to tell them about your faith, you're like, I don't want to do that. That's hard. Your friends who, who need to hear about your faith and Jesus die at a young age, that's hard. Like to live with the weight and the baggage of things that go against God's plan, that is way harder than just being obedient to what God has called us to. I'm telling you from personal experience, it is much better to follow God's plan, to follow his will, than it is to go against it. And Jonah is going to learn that the hard way. Look at verse 4. It says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. I want you to remember that phrase. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship to pray. No, wait. He went there to sleep. And the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps your God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. See, the, the sailors were like freaked out right now. They're like, this is something I've never seen before. And you can see that they have some idea of like spirituality. They're praying to their God. It has it in lowercase g intentionally. And they're like, they have this idea. One of the commentaries I wrote had a really unique idea about what was happening in the storm right here. See, say, these guys were mariners. They probably did this route over and over and over again. So they were probably used to like storms come and go, we'll be fine. What they were experiencing was like extraterrestrial, was like uh, something that was wild, was never before seen for them. One of the commentators described it as they're in the middle of the storm, but they can like see off in the horizon and ships are just like cruising. They can like see everything around them is fine, but wherever they are, is a storm. And it's a bad storm. It is the worst storm. They've never had a storm this bad. And they knew that something was wrong, that something was going on that was causing this storm in the middle of the sea. And so what they did in verse 7, it says, they said to one another, come let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. Then they just started questioning him. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. I fear Yahweh. He's not saying little G God there. He is saying big G God, the God of heaven who made the heavens and the, it actually says who made the sea and the dry land. We see that phrase, who made the heavens and the earth, all throughout the Bible. And in this case, Jonah's like, no, 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 he did make the heavens, he did make the earth, but right now, he made the sea and he made the land. He's keeping us from the land, he's keeping us right here because this is the God that I have offended. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord 
because he had told them. See, Jonah knew and he was making it clear that this is why we are in this mess. I am the reason that things are bad right now. The God of heaven, the God who made heavens and earth, the God who made the sea and the land, that is who is causing this turmoil in our life. And he's doing it because of Jonah's rebellion and because of Jonah's disregard for what God had told him to do. Look at the next verse, verse 11. It says, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you to, the, to make the sea uh, quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry. Man, if I were those guys, and I knew that Jonah had done something bad, and I wanted to be all superstitious, I would have been like, you're out of here. Like, if you cause me to be, in, I'm already terrified of drowning. But I was like, if you cause me to be in this mess, like, you are done. And they're like, no, no, we want to give it one more chance. So they rode uh, to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against him. Look at verse 14. It says, therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. They were like, we're going to kill him, but God, don't like hold us accountable for that because we're only doing this because you're telling us, you're kind of like uh, aligning all of these things to make it happen. It says, oh Lord, you have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, obviously, these guys, they, they had already thrown over all of their cargo. So this offering a sacrifice, like this was a lasting impression on their life. It wasn't something that happened in the moment and they were like, okay, we're done. They like, it really impacted them so that whenever they got to, to see, they actually made an altar and they vowed to the Lord. It really impacted uh, their life. And I think that when we have an encounter with God, when we have God, when he does something in our life like this, it is something that lasts. It's something that we remember. So what our sailors are trying to do here uh, in this part is they're saying, we know that this Yahweh, this God is righteous. He is someone who is, who is perfectly good and he's perfectly righteous. And obviously Jonah has done something bad and therefore this divine being is doing something to harm us because of Jonah's wrongdoing. This is this kind of pattern. And we actually do this in our life. You know, like we do something bad, we mess up, we sin, and we're just kind of like, like crouching, like, all right, God, like, what are you going to do to me now? Or like, you know, we do this. And I don't think that's really how things work uh, in our world today, in our relationship with God because of Jesus. But that is what these guys are trying to do. They're trying to figure out something bad is happening to us because somebody has done something wrong to God. But that doesn't necessarily translate super well for us. Um, but I, I do think that as we get into situations like Jonah's in, there are definitely things that stick out. Things that happen in our life that resemble what Jonah is going through now. And what Jonah is doing is he is intentionally running away from God and God's plan. Now I want us to think through, what does that look like? What does it look like when we run, intentionally run away from God and his plan. I think there are five things that can help us kind of process through what does that look like. The first one is super obvious, all right? The first one is that we ignore God's commands. We just ignore them. Like God tells us to do something and we're like, screw that. I don't want to do that. That sounds dumb. I'm not going to do it. That's the first sign that you know you're running from God's plan and what his desire is for you. I felt like this one was, was, I think this fits all of us. Look at what Ephesians 4.29 says. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't let anything come out of your mouth that isn't uplifting to the people around you. How many of you in here this week have said something degrading to somebody else? All right. We're all raising our hand because we are disregarding God's commands. Like we like to think that all of the bad things and all the really bad sinners and the terrible people are like out there. Like they're out there on the, like they're doing bad stuff. They're like killing people and like we, they're bad and we're good. We're, we're okay. Like we got this figured out. No. 
The same thing that Jonah is doing in fleeing what God has told him to do is the same thing we do all the time. God tells us to not let anything that comes out of our mouth be unwholesome, to not be lifting up other people. And we tear people down all the time. Social media, man, we will rip somebody apart because we can hide behind a screen. Like, we are mean people. I am guilty of it myself. And the reality is that that is no different than what Jonah is doing right now. He is disregarding what God has told him to do. It might even be something that's just like a little jab. Like, we're over here, you know, playing spike ball. We're doing some sport. And you're just like, you suck right? And we think that is funny, but really, man, it jabs that person. It really does tear them down. It really does bring them down. And the Bible is telling us, don't let anything unwholesome come out of your mouth. We gossip, we lie, we deceive, and all of those things are ignoring God's commands for our life. That is the first step of knowing, am I intentionally running away from God and His plan Do I disregard his word? Do I disregard what he's told me to do? Another one is that our life is full of turmoil. Like, like think about Jonah right now. Jonah's in a crappy spot, am I right? Like, nothing good is going to come out of this thing with Jonah. He's literally surrounded by a bunch of guys, and they're like, we're going to throw you off this boat because you are put us in this mess. Like, Like, his life is full of turmoil. It's a mess. I think that our life gets like this sometimes too. I want you to think about this in the realm of relationships, all right? I mean, you can think about it in the relationship with a friend, but I think specifically when I think about it in this way of the turmoil, I think about it in relationships with like your significant other. Maybe some of you are dating in here right now, or you have dated in the past, or you're like thinking about dating or whatever that looks like in 2021, Um, Zoom dating, I don't know. Um, and your relationships with your significant other, with your friends, are like roller coasters. Like, it's like a great day, and like two days later, you guys are like spitting at each other's throats. Like, you're like, we're going to fight. We're going we're gonna to take this to the parking lot and fight right now. And then like two days later, you're good. And the, I mean, it is just a roller coaster. Like, I've seen some of you guys. It's, it's, it actually is kind of scary, to be honest with you. But that is oftentimes what our relationships look like, like roller coasters, like highs and lows and highs and lows. Like we are oftentimes ignoring God's ideas about relationships. We're ignoring God's ideas about dating and about sex, and it shows. How many of you in this room, if you're, if you're significant others in here, this is gonna, might be a little bit awkward, but how many of you in this room have either gone through a really bad breakup or you've had like really big fights in your relationship? All right. A lot of us, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> I just see some pairs, like one raises their hand, one doesn't. Never mind. Okay. Uh, like, yeah, you've gone through like a bad breakup or, um, listen, you can't hold, uh, if you're significant, you can't hold that against them. All right. Don't, I did not start anything. Okay. Yeah. Like, I think that when that happens, the reason that oftentimes, and I know that it, I found it true in myself, even arguments in my own marriage, The reason that happens is because, first of all, we've disregarded some of God's command in our life. For me, oftentimes, it's because I'm not being humble. Like, I am just a jerk. And my wife gets mad at me, and we argue, and I realize, you know what? God, I have completely disregarded your commands for me to be a certain way towards my wife. For those of you who are dating, maybe you've disregarded God's commands about sex. Maybe you disregarded God's commands about how you should treat somebody. And I think that those things are oftentimes the root of turmoil, of arguments in our relationships. It's because we've disregarded what God has commanded for it, what, what God's plan would be for that relationship. If you're in a season of turmoil right now, like if you just think about that, like there's some part of your life, some relationship in your life that there is turmoil, I would bet that it has something to do with your not following God's plan for that. Whether you disregard it and you're sinning, or whether it's just not what God wants for you in your life, that that turmoil is an evidence of intentionally running from God and His plan. The third one is this, is that we go to sleep. Like we know a storm is coming, Jonah knows a storm's coming, and it's like so counterintuitive, but he goes down to the bottom and is like, I'm just going to go to sleep. And now we don't actually go to sleep, but we become super apathetic. 
Like we, our life is just so filled with apathy that we like don't care. We're like, I'm disregarding what God wants me to do. I'm like done with that. I, uh, yeah, my, my life's a mess. My relationships are a mess. This area of my life is a mess. And I don't feel like dealing with it. I don't feel like dealing with the mess that's happening in my life. I don't feel like doing anything about it. And we just become apathetic. We ju- we're just like through with it. We're just like, I don't feel like dealing with this anymore. And that is what Jonah is doing in this story. He is so bound to not giving in to what God has for him and not dealing with his own crap that he's like, I don't want to deal with this. I'm going to go to sleep while these guys die on their boat. And the reality is we do the same thing, but I think it looks very different than what Jonah has happening. What Jonah is doing is literally going to sleep. What we do is we find a hobby and we say, you know what? I'm going to spend all of my time doing this that we don't have to deal with this. I'm going to excel in this sport so much that I don't have to think about and I don't have to deal with the areas of my life that I'm disregarding God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend my time doing all of this so I don't have to deal with it. And I think that's just part of our culture of being so busy all the time. Our social media profiles are like perfect, right? The best filters, all the best pictures. Nobody knows anything's going on in our life. And our life is a mess, Like our life is full of problems, but people don't know that because we just want to post like the best stuff. We want to have like the perfect Instagram post. And that is just a way of hiding. I feel like that is a true outward emotion of our apathy that we don't want to deal with the areas of our life that God has called us to a standard that we're just disregarding. We just say, we don't want to, I don't want to deal with it. And so we find other ways to take our mind off of it. So we get to this point. That we're just about to go overboard, right? These guys are like, all right, well, God, don't hold us accountable to this, and they're going to chunk him over the side. And we've ignored God's commands. Our life is full of turmoil. We're apathetic about just about everything except our Instagram. And our sin is really uh, detrimental to our lives. And so, actually, I skipped a point. At this point, uh, this is where we begin to reap what we sow, all right? We begin to reap what we sow. I, I know Tim. Where's Tim at? I don't see you out here. Yeah, Tim's a farmer, so he knows exactly what this is. But many of the, these words might not, uh, might not fit. So reaping what you sow has to do with like, uh, reaping is like, uh, I'm sorry, sowing is like planting. Like you're going to plant something, and then it grows, and it grows and grows until it's time for harvest. And then you reap it. You harvest that produce or whatever it is that you planted. Now, there's a significant amount of time between planting and between harvest. And I think this is where we see that Jonah's sin is a longer process. He doesn't just sin and immediately harvest the the detrimental things about that sin. There is a period of time that kind of grows where this sin really begins to come full circle. I hesitated to share this next story, but I was like, why not? Like, it is just, I think you'll definitely connect uh, with me, uh, but I am being super vulnerable right now. So the way that I feel like this has really shown up in my life is when I was your age, and I found myself looking at porn a lot. Like, in the moment, I was like, this is cool. Like, I like this. This is fine. There's no, like, there's like no problems with this. And then as it kept going on in my life and I realized that this was a really big problem, I realized this really affects the way that I look at people. This affects my relationship. This affects the way that I treat people, the way that I go into relationships, the way that I see people at value. This really does affect me. And I began to reap that detriment of the sin that I was planting in my life. And it continued to grow and grow and grow until it dies. And I think that is so true, whether it is porn or whether it's some other sin in your life, you may not feel the harvest of it yet, but I think that there will come a time when you realize this is bad. This is not good for me. And that is where Jonah is at. I don't think that his um, disobedience to God started simply at this. I, I would imagine that it had built up over some period of time. And now he's like, yeah, God, I'm not going to Nineveh. 
Mm, I'm not doing that. And so we see this process that we are about to go overboard. We've ignored God's commands. Our life is full of turmoil. We're apathetic. And sin is really showing its problems in our life. We realize that things are really detrimental to us. And this is when God provides. All right? Do you remember back in verse 4, I said, I want you to remember this phrase. You guys remember that? Who, does anybody remember the phrase? Anybody? Nobody. Perfect. All right. Let's read verse 4 again. I think it's up there. It should be up there. I think it's up there. It says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Who put Jonah in that storm? Not himself. Who put Jonah in the storm? God did. God is the one who created and provided and hurled that storm at Jonah. I think that there are seasons and times of our life where it is really crappy. Like there are things that happen to us and we're like, there's no way God's real. Like God doesn't give cancer. God doesn't cause miscarriages. God doesn't uh, ruin GPAs. God doesn't take away scholarships. God doesn't take away relationships. God doesn't do that. That can't be God. And I think the reality of it is, at times, I'm not saying every time, but there are seasons where I think God is the one who has created that turmoil, who has created that in your life. Not because he hates you. God doesn't hate Jonah. God wants absolutely what's best for Jonah. God creates those storms at times because he's trying to wake us up from the bottom of our boat. He's trying to wake us up for us to realize that we have to get back on track. We have to get back to where God wants us to be. And that is where God is providing for Jonah. God is the one who made that the way that it was. It put them in the sea because God is waking Jonah up. In our story tonight, there's really two different groups of people. And I think you might resonate with one more than the other. In fact, if you're looking at your card, you can go ahead and see who those two people are. I think some of you can relate with Jonah a little more. You're like, yeah, I get that. I'm, I'm a little bit like Jonah. Like you feel like there are some areas of your life where you are not wholeheartedly following God's plan for it. If you're in this room and you're like, I'm a Christian, I know that there may be some of you in here like, I'm not a Christian. I'm just kind of here to hang out with my friends, and that's fine. But if you're in this room and you're a Christian, there is some area of your life that you have not wholeheartedly committed to God. I'm telling you that. The best Christian in this room is not perfect. The best Christian in this room has not got everything figured out. And if you feel like you do, you're wrong. All right? None of us have every area of our life perfectly submitted to exactly how God wants us to be. And in those situations where we are disregarding God's commands, where we're not wholeheartedly in it, we are running from God. We are intentionally going away from God's command. And I think that is how you may uh, relate with Jonah. If you're not sure, like, what area of my life am I not wholeheartedly or fully really committed to God, you could check the symptoms. There were five of them, right? You could see what part of your life is full of turmoil. The first one's the easy one. What part of your life are you completely disregarding God? What, where in your life is there turmoil? Is it bad? Is it messy? What part of your life are you apathetic? Are you like, I don't want to deal with that right now. That's not cool. Like, I really want to do this because I don't want to deal with that. I think that... Um, there are definitely areas in your life where you, where you are running from God, that you haven't really committed it completely. And this is my challenge for you, is to just stop. Like, stop running from God. Stop going away from what God has for you. Stop disregarding what he wants for you. Maybe tonight would be the night you just draw the line. You're saying, you know what? I know that I'm not supposed to do that, and so I'm going to work to not do that. Will you be perfect? Probably not. Most likely not. You won't, okay? But you can try. You can at least work towards it. And I have some steps for you later on. Because like I said, I think that going against God's plan is much harder in the long run. When you look at the long-term game, it's much harder to go against God's plan than it is to go with it. Now, some of you in here are like, yeah, I don't relate with Jonah because I don't, like, I don't know God. 
and I don't want to have anything to do with that right now. And neither did the sailors. Did you notice, like, as they were praying, they were praying to their little G God, and uh, they, they kind of felt like um, they kind of had this idea of religion, but they didn't really uh, know this Yahweh or this Hebrew God that Jonah was talking about. Like, maybe you've tried that. You've tried calling out to God, little G God, and nothing happens. Like, you've seen these hypocritical Christians who's like, hey, you should follow Jesus. And then their life is like nothing like what Jesus actually says your life is supposed to be like. My hope and prayer for you tonight is that you would be like those sailors who didn't enter that boat knowing or loving or trusting the one true God. When they left the boat, they did. Their sacrifice was evidence of that, that they really embraced the one true God. That is my hope and my prayer for you tonight. So as we remember in this series that God is the one who provides even when we aren't really ready, even when we are reluctant to what God has for us. He may provide something that looks amazing. He may provide a storm. We can't control what he will provide, but we can control what our response is to that. And I hope that your response is that you stop running from him that you understand God's commands and that you embrace that. I'm going to have the band come up. We're going to do one more song here at the end. And this is my prayer for you, that as we sing this last song, that you really consider what that might be in your life. Look at what the psalmist says about this. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. In Psalm 51, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I hope that that is our prayer to God. If you're like, I don't really know what area that is, God will help you. It says, search me and know me. God will reveal that area of your life where you aren't submitted to him. Maybe you know it. You're like, man, yeah, I know exactly what I need to do. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. That can be your prayer tonight. God wants you to turn back to him. He'll help you figure out which area of your life it is that is broken. So the band is going to play, and I want you to pray. I want you to really worship and meditate on what God is showing and revealing you in your life tonight. Band, I'm going to let you guys go ahead.